Okay, so like a lot of things in this class, we just need practice, right? And one of the things that comes up a lot is being able to express a thought in your mind, which you might articulate as an English sentence, but which, as we learned in the first segment of this episode, is most likely not an English sentence to start with. But learning how to express a thought in first order predicate logic, right? Because in order to get a computer to understand what we're trying to tell it, we need to talk to it in its own language. And the language of assertions, the language of knowledge is oftentimes FOPC, first order predicate calculus, right? So what we're going to do in this segment is simply get some practice expressing sentences in that way. And I think you'll find it's very tricky. It's not rocket science, but it's also prone to mistakes, right? Because there's a lot of different pitfalls we can fall into. So let's uh, begin with an easy one, right? So how about this sentence? Which is a sentiment that lots of people have said. It's a proverb. Nobody's perfect. Ain't it the truth? How would we express that in first order predicate logic? Well, you have to decide what your predicates are. And so I'm going to kind of guide us through this whole thing. And in the quick review, I'm going to specify what all the predicates are. But of course, part of the art of learning how to express knowledge in a knowledge base is deciding what the predicates are, which is by no means an easy thing. So let's say that we've got a predicate called perfect. And that takes an X. And if we assert that perfect is true for some X, we're saying that that person's perfect, right? So how would you express nobody's perfect? Several different ways. In fact, there's many different answers for all these, but here's one I can think of. Simple as that. For all X, it's not true that perfect of X, okay? So that's saying that for every single person or actually every single being, right? That being is not perfect. And that would be the case if we're talking about humans. Of course, we could throw a human of X implies not perfect of X, right? In order to accommodate perfect beings that are non-human. But that is certainly a way to do it if we're only thinking about humans. Now, let me give an example of just a wrong one, right? And this, you know, this episode is similar to some of the past ones in that it's easy to think you have the wrong answer and not, right? So a lot of students would write something like that down. This is absolutely the wrong answer, okay? This is true, but it's not nearly strong enough. It doesn't match this English sentence. This here is saying it's not the case that all people are perfect, okay? Now, if that doesn't strike you as different, think it through. This is saying that it's not true that everybody's perfect. Now, clearly it's not true that everybody's perfect but when i say this thing up here i'm saying something much stronger right i'm saying that there isn't a single case of someone who's perfect not only that it's not true that everybody's perfect but that it's not true that any single one person is perfect and therefore this is an invalid expression of this sentence and i can't state that strongly enough if you fed this thing to a knowledge base it would actually in this case not be misled and think anything is right, which is actually is wrong, but it would fail to draw a number of different conclusions that it needs to, right? In particular, if you had this in your knowledge base, this red sentence right here, and then someone were to suggest perfect Stephen, your knowledge base would not be able to tell that that's false based on this information, right? Because this, this information merely says it's not true that everybody's perfect. Well, okay, we know that not everybody's perfect, fine, but that doesn't contradict this. This is simply saying there is a perfect person named Stephen, and there could be one. In fact, there could be a hundred, and that doesn't contradict the red thing. It would only contradict the red thing if we were to assert that every single person is perfect, right? So make sure you get that. And let me just state another equivalent way of writing this, right, which would also be a correct answer, so I'll put it in blue, and that is this. Um... Now that is a horse of an entirely different color, right? This red thing says, it's not true that everybody's perfect, fine. But this thing is in fact saying the strong thing that we wanted to say. This is saying there does not exist any person. There does not exist a single X such that perfect is X, okay? Perfect of X is true. And therefore this blue one here and this blue one here are both correct answers to this. This red one absolutely is not, okay? Let's do another one. What if I were to say this, which we often hear in our part of the country? No self-respecting Redskins fan is also a Cowboys fan. Those two things are held in our part of the country to be mutually exclusive. You cannot be both, right? 
So, how would you express this predicate logic? Here's one way I can think of. How about this? There does not exist an X such that redskins of X and cowboys of X. That seems like it makes sense, right? This is saying you can't find a single example of someone who is both a Redskins fan and a Cowboys fan. So I would claim that's a correct answer. Another one would be something like this. For all X, Redskins of X implies not Cowboys of X. So this is saying if you are a Redskins fan, then that implies, and you can take to the bank, that you are not a Cowboys fan. Those two things cannot both be true because the left one would imply the right one. And that is true for all X, right? And just a note on that, we've assumed throughout this problem that we're only dealing with humans, right? And so if it were possible for some other animal, maybe deer or something like that, to be Redskins fans or whatever, and that, that this statement was only true for humans or whatever, we would need to throw humans of X in there or we would need to say, you know, there does not exist any X Element of age, so the, the, such that this is true, right? So that's just kind of a, a general warning. Another example, uh, and then we'll get some quick review and we'll let you answer them, right? What if I were to say this? Um, every UMW professor, other than first-year profs, so when you're a first-year professor, they don't actually give you any advisees, but... If, as long as you're not a first-year professor, we're going to say every UMW professor is the academic advisor of or advises at least one student. So expressing this in predicate logic, we might have some things like Professor X would be true for professors. Student of X would be true for students. has taught years X and N. This right here would imply that Professor X has taught that many years. Okay, It's kind of awkward to, to say in, in words here because we're having to sort of put the entire words of the predicate before any of the arguments, right? What you'd really like to say is something like X has taught N years. That's what would match the English sentence of that assertion, but we can't do that here because that's not the way the syntax works. So we're going to say that we have a has taught four years or has taught years predicate, and you give it two arguments. One is the name of a professor, and one is the number of years that professor has taught, okay? And then we're going to reuse one of the predicates that we had in an earlier example, advises. So we're going to say that prof and student are the two arguments. And if I say advises Stephen, comma, Elizabeth, that means Stephen is the academic advisor of Elizabeth, okay? So notice we can call our arguments anything we want, X and prof student, it doesn't matter. I'd name them, you know, things to help us understand what they are when there's more than one, right? Here, I'm just gonna call it X because, you know, basically, am I a professor? Yes. Are you a professor? Probably not. Is a toaster a professor? No. So it's just obvious that there's only one thing, and that's the thing that we're checking to see whether it's a professor. But here, you might not know what order the arguments are going to go in or something like that, right? Okay, so let's express this sentence here in predicate logic using these things. So what we want to do is we want to say, and again, there's multiple ways to do this, but let's say there's some x, and that x is a prof, and we're going to say that it's also true that this X I'm talking about has not taught one year. Okay, so here's an assertion saying X is a professor and it's not true that X has taught one year. I'm going to say that for all X, that being true implies, I'm going to go to the next line here, but I'm just going over one line, right? Implies that there exists some Y such that student of Y is true and advises X comma Y is true, okay? Again, multiple ways to do this, but stare at that green thing for a minute and make sure you understand it. 
This is saying that every single X you could name might be a professor, might be a third year professor, might be a first year professor, might be a student, might be a toaster, might be an alien, any X. Here's what's true. If that X is a professor and that X has not taught exactly one year, so that would mean that this X is not a first year professor, that's sort of what this whole bit implies there, or what that whole bit sort of, you know, contains, is the information that X is in fact a professor, but this X has not taught only one year. We're gonna say that for any X you can think of, that thing being true would then imply that there is some student that that X advises. So notice we've got an X and a Y going on here. The X is bound, as it's called, or quantified by this outer for all thing, right? So this X is quantified by this universal quantifier, whereas the Y is not bound until we get inside here, nested inside to this, um, there exists, existential quantifier, which is fine because the first clause doesn't involve Y, right? If I had a Y out here inside this uh, first clause, then this whole thing wouldn't parse because it would be like, wait, what's Y? I've never heard of Y. But we're not using Y until we get here, and so it's okay. So this is saying for all X, being a professor and having not taught one year implies that there's some student that is your, that, that is your advisee, okay? Now, again, it's very easy to think you have the right answer or not, and to state confidently your answer on a homework or in a knowledge base and then end up with a bad grade or end up with wrong conclusions being drawn, right, down the line. So, you know, the best thing to do is just practice. So let's get some practice and do some quick review here. So I'm going to give you some sets and some predicates that you're allowed to use. And again, I want you to stop the video and work these out because you really won't learn this stuff unless you take the time to try to express it and then see what you might have done wrong. And I'll try to point out common things that you might have done wrong because your answer might be correct even if it differs from mine, right? But let's say for this first example, we're going to have two sets, M and C. And that's the set of all UMW majors. So computer science is an element of M, as is art history, as is political science, as is English lit, etc., right? And then C is going to be the set of all courses at UMW, this course, Computer Science 125 being one of them. And we're going to have a predicate saying major requires course. That means in order to major in M, you must take course C. So in order to major in computer science, you have to take computer science 220 and 230 and 330 and 305 and several others. In order to major in English, you need to have major, you need to take uh, English 205 and 306 and several others. In order to major in um, Physics, you need to take Physics 101 and 102. You also need to take Math 121, right? So this basically just says, does, does the major require the course? For all pairs of majors and courses for which that's true, this predicate is going to return true and be a true, right? Okay, so uh, here's your first one. Computer Science 125 is required for the UMW Computer Science major. How would you express that in predicate logic? Stop the video and think it out. That's an easy one because that's just like that, right? There aren't any variables. We're just stating flatly, major requires course, computer science, comma 125. This ends up actually being a hard one for students sometimes because they get so wrapped up in the quantifier thing with for all X and there exists Y and all that kind of stuff that they kind of forget that you can just flat make a statement by just asserting it about a literal value here. And so that's what we're doing here, right? All right, what if we say English 306 isn't required for the computer science major? Same thing, we just put a not in front of it, right? It's not the case that computer science requires English 306, if I were to sort of spell that out in more of an English word uh, order. All right, what if I'm going to say art history 124 isn't required for any major at UMW? I would, one way to do that is this way. I'm going to say there does not exist a major. There does not exist any M, which is an element of the set M, such that M requires Art History 124. Several other ways to do it. You could do it with a universal qualifier too, right? You can say for all M, that's an element of M. It is not the case that major requires course M Art History 124, right? So by changing it to a for all and moving the not inside, that would also end up, end up being a correct one. Multiple ways to do it. How about this? 
Every major at UMW requires at least one specific course. And, and what I mean by this is it's not the case that you could find an all elective major, right? Some students might like that. They say, oh man, if I take computer science, I have to take this course, which I hate. And if I take math, I have to take this course that I hate. And if I major in uh, political science, I'm gonna have to take this course, what I hate, which I hate, doggone it. Isn't there any major where I can just take what I want? And this statement in English is saying, no, 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 that's not the case. There isn't any major like that because every major requires at least one specific course. How would you express that in first order logic? Here's one way. For all majors, there exists a course such that the major requires the course. Okay, get the order there correct. Don't swap the order or mess that up. This is saying for every single major, let's choose one. How about history? There exists at least one course which you must take, you have no choice about. So maybe History 122 is one of the ones you have to take for history. Or maybe Math 121 is one you have to take for the physics major, right? So this is saying for all majors, there exists at least one course that the major requires it. Now what if I say this? There is a course at UMW, a special course, that's required for every major. Every student has to take it no matter what you major in. As a matter of fact, there is one freshman seminar you must take at Mary Washington, regardless of what else uh, you major in, right? How would you express that in predicate logic? And there's one way to do that. This is exactly the same thing we had that last slide, except that we reverse the order of the there exists a C and the for all M, right? Let me go back and show you. Here's the one we had before. This said for all M, there exists a C such that M requires C. And now here we said there exists a C for which for all M, M requires it. So kind of interesting there, right? Here we're saying there is some magic course that every single major requires. Whereas before we were saying for every single major, I can pick a course for that major that the major requires it. Okay, so very, very different meaning if we reverse the order there. It will not be stating the same thing. All right, let's get off this uh, course thing. Let's just talk about hobbies here. Suppose I say, you know, Laura either likes kayaking or canoeing. I forget which. In fact, I confuse those because I don't do either one. But I remember her telling me, Laura either likes kayaking or canoeing. How would I say that in pretty good logic? I would say, human Laura... True, it doesn't actually say that in the sentence. I'm kind of going with that, that, you know, we don't have, you know, cats or coyotes kayaking, right? So we'll say human Laura is one of the things implied by this sentence. And not only that, so we're stating two different things here, human Laura and Laura likes kayaking or Laura likes canoeing. Keep in mind, Laura could like both, and this would still be true, right? Because this is an inclusive or here. But I'm simply stating two different things. First of all, Laura's human. Second of all, she likes one or the other or both. How about this? Some people like UFC, that's a full combat fighting thing, and they like knitting, so you might not think those go together, but don't be a hater. How would I express that? Here I'm fudging a little bit. This says some people, which might imply that there's more than one, but I'm going to kind of fall back and say, well, there's at least one, right? So at least some person likes both these things. So I'm going to say there exists a P such that P is human, P likes UFC, and P likes knitting. Those three different things I'm asserting, all of which are in a row. All right, now let's do some harder ones here. NFL team is a predicate, and Super Bowl is a predicate. So if you don't know football, there are two different, basically, divisions in NFL football. Every team is either in the AFC or in the NFC. And the winner of the AFC, which is half the teams, and the winner of the NFC, which is the other half of the teams, play each year in the Super Bowl, right? So this predicate here, Super Bowl, is true for the following triples. If I give an AFC team here as the first argument, an NFC team here as the second argument, and a year as the third argument, then Super Bowl of that, that, that is going to be true if this AFC team that I've given and this NFC team that I've given did in fact play in the Super Bowl in that year. Okay, so AFC means an AFC team. I, I could have written that out, but I was trying to be a little bit more compact, right? So that's what that means. Okay, so given these two predicates then, how would I express this fact? Green Bay played Denver in 1998. And here's what I'm going to say. I claim that there's three different assertions in this sentence. One is that the Packers are an NFL team. If you didn't know that, you can glean that from this sentence. 
The second fact is that the Broncos are an NFL team, and if you didn't know that, you could get that out of this sentence. And then the third one is that the Broncos were the AFC team and the Packers were the NFC team in the 1998 Super Bowl. Okay? Notice I had to flip the order of the teams here when I fed them into the Super Bowl predicate. That's because the, this predicate expects to see an AFC first and an NFC team second, right? Just by alphabetical order. All right, what if I said this? Not every NFL team has made it to the Super Bowl. Sadly, as I mentioned before, the Kansas City Chiefs have not. Um, actually, Kansas City Chiefs have made it. They just haven't ever won it. But there are teams that have never even made it to the Super Bowl. San Diego Chargers come to mind, right? So what is the way of expressing this in predicate logic? I would claim this is a way. This is one of the tougher ones, so let me slow down here, right? This says that it's not the case that... And now here's the rest of my sentence. Okay, so the first thing we're doing is negating what I'm saying. So I'm saying it is not the case that for every single T you can imagine, the Packers, the Broncos, the Chargers, the Yankees, my toaster, right? T can be anything. It is not the case that for all T, that T being an NFL team, instead of a toaster or a baseball team or something else, would imply that that team has played in the Super Bowl. And how do I express that that team T has played in the Super Bowl? Well, there exists a Y and there exists an O, such that either this team that I'm talking about, this T, was the AFC team and they had an opponent, that's what O stands for, and that opponent was playing that AFC team in year-wise Super Bowl, or maybe that team is the NFC team and playing the other team as the AFC team in that wide Super Bowl, okay? So there's two different ways that you can play in the Super Bowl. One is you're an NFC team playing another AFC team, and the other way is you can be an AFC team playing a different NFC team, right? And I'm saying those two things here are connected with an or because either one of those could be true, and in either case, it would represent that you played in the Super Bowl last year, or that year, excuse me. So what we're saying here is that it's not the case that being an NFL team implies that there's some opponent and some year where you played that opponent in year-wise Super Bowl, okay? In particular, you know, some sucky team, um, the, you know, Cleveland Browns, whatever. The Cleveland Browns, there is no Y and no O. There's no opponent and no year that they played that opponent in the Super Bowl because they've never been, okay? All right. If you wear sunglasses, you're hiding something. Someone might say that. How would you express that to a computer? There's one way. For all X, that means for everybody, this is true, right? Because what I really meant here was, if a person wears sunglasses, then that person is hiding something. I didn't literally mean you. If I actually meant if you wear sunglasses, you're hiding something, but that's not a property that's true of the whole human race, then you know I'd, I'd do it differently. But you know, colloquially in English, which again is why English is not at all a good language to use for expressing knowledge to a computer, because it's just very you know ambiguous and, and imprecise. But normally in English, if we say if you do this, you know, we mean if anybody does this, right? Okay, so for all X. If you are wearing sunglasses, there I said you again, right? So for all X, if X is wearing sunglasses, then that implies that there is something that they are hiding. So notice the use of a universal quantifier and an existential quantifier here both, and you can't mess them up or interchange them or change the order or anything else. This is saying if you are wearing sunglasses, then there exists at least one thing that you are hiding. All right. Some days feel like certain activities, right? So we're going to have a predicate day feels like with a day and an activity. And I want to express some days I feel like singing and on those days I never feel like crying. Aw, how do you express that in predicate logic? Here's a way to do it. Check this bad boy out. Notice I have an and here. So I'm really expressing two different facts in this statement. In fact, there's an and right here in the English statement tipping us off to that, right? That won't always be the case. But clearly, I am expressing two things in this sentence. One thing I'm expressing is that there are days when I feel like singing. Then the second thing I'm expressing is on those days where I feel like singing, I don't feel like crying. So there's two separate assertions here, and it's imperative that we include both in the predicate logic expression. Otherwise, we're leaving something out. So what I've done here is I've expressed the first one first and the second one second, right? The first one is there exists at least one day where I feel like singing. 
Then the second thing is that for all days on which I feel like singing, it is not the case that I feel like crying on that day. Okay? So both those things together lead to this English sentence. All right. This is a toughie. Okay? So think hard about this one. Barack Obama is the only African-American president in U.S. history. As of this recording, that is the case. How would I express that in predicate logic, given only those two predicates? Now, let's see if you got this. This is a tricky one. Mm. All right. So first of all, I'm going to claim that there are three pieces of information contained in this sentence. Three pieces of information. One is Barack Obama is African-American. The second is Barack Obama is a president. The third is that Barack Obama is the only African-American president. And I realize now that I typed president down here and I have has ever been president up here. So sorry about that. I, I abbreviated, which is actually good because it would have run off the screen. But anyway, so that by this has ever been president, I mean the same thing as president here. That was just a uh, typo. Okay, so... I'm going to express those three things. Now, the first two are simple. How do I say Obama is an African-American? I just say African-American Obama. If I assert that, then great. I've got Obama as an African-American. If I assert president or has ever been president Obama, then I'm asserting that he's a president, right? So those are easy to do, but a couple things. First of all, don't forget you can put a literal thing here like Obama, right? It doesn't have to be a variable. Second thing, just don't forget it, right? Because you can get so caught up in the tough part that it's easy to kind of leave out the easy part, right? Now the tough part. Okay, so I bet very few of you got this, but it actually makes sense when you think about it. Here's the way I'm going to express the only part. I'm going to say, again, three things. But I'm going to say there does not exist any X for which all three of these are true. So here we are. Thing number one is that that X is African-American. Thing number two is that X has been the president. Thing number three is that X is not Obama. So not equals is just what that means. Not equals here, right? So what I'm saying is there's not a single X you can name where that person is African-American and a president and not Obama. Okay? So if we see how this works, let's go back to this example here and let me just kind of spell it out here, right? Let's, let's take some candidate people here. First, let's write it out, right? So we're saying that there does not exist any X such that African American of X and President of X and X is not equal to Obama. Now, I'm saying there does not exist any single X for which that's true, all right? So I'm going to try some X's and verify that it's not true for any of them, right? For one, we'll try uh, George Washington. For another one, we'll try Will Smith. For another one, we'll try a toaster. For another one, we'll try Barack Obama. And if you want to try it with some other ones, fine, but I'm going to claim that these kind of give us all the cases here. So when I say there does not exist any X for which those three things are all true, I'm going to say that must be the case for all four of these things and other, right? So let's take George Washington here. Is he African American? No, so that's false. Was he president? Yes, that's true. Is he not equal to Obama? Yes, he sure is not the same as Barack Obama. So is it true that false and true and true is true? Alas, no, that equals false, right? Because we know that for ands, everything has to be true in order for the and to be true. And in this case, we only have two out of three. All right, so Will Smith, is he African-American? Yes. Is he president or has ever been? No, at least as of this recording. Is he not equal to Obama? Yep, sure is not equal to Obama. So is this true? Alas, no, because true and false and true is going to equal false. Again, two out of three. All right, what about a toaster? Is my toaster African-American? No. Is my toaster president of the United States or has ever been? No, thank God. Is my toaster not equal to a Barack Obama? Yes, my toaster is not the same as Barack Obama. And therefore, false and false and true is going to be false. Lastly, Barack Obama, is he African-American? Yep, sure is. Is he or has he ever been president of the United States? Yes, he is. Oh, baby, two out of three. We're, all we need is the third one to get it true. But alas, no, because Obama is not not equal to Obama, right? Obama 
is Obama, right? So that's why that last clause makes sure that he too ends up with a false answer. And that's how I can have the audacity to claim that there does not exist any X at all for which that is true. Okay, so the not equal to Obama thing is a pattern we haven't seen before, but that certainly makes this thing work, right? You could also do it where, you know, X not being equal to Obama implies that they are not an African-American president, right? So there's several different ways to do it. This is simply one. All right, and now a couple more. Um, here's one. There's never been a gay marriage performed in Utah. Maybe I should say gay wedding. You don't really perform a marriage, I guess, but, you know. Um, we're going to have male and female as predicates here. We're also going to have married in state, which is going to be true if X and Y are two people who were married in a particular state. Okay, so married in state Stephen, Rachel, Texas is actually going to be true because Stephen and Rachel were married in Texas, right? How would I express this? There has never been a gay marriage performed in Utah thing in predicate logic, do you think? And here's one way to do it. We can say there does not exist an X and a Y pair, right? There does not exist an X such that you can find a Y such that the following thing is true, okay? So what's not true for any X and Y? Here's what it is. First of all, X and Y are both male or X and Y are both female. So this first little thing here, you know, demarcated by that parenthesis and that parenthesis there says X and Y are both male or X and Y are both female. Now, what I'm claiming is that that is not true for any X and Y and also it true that X and Y were married in Utah. So a lot of different operations here, a lot of different weird orderings and groupings here. You just got to stare at that and say, is it true that I cannot find any X and Y such that either X and Y are both male or X and Y are both female? One of those two is true. And also X and Y were married in Utah. If it is in fact the case that there is no X and Y for which that all is true, then that would be the case that there has never been a gay wedding performed in Utah. And by the way, I don't know if that's true or not. This is kind of a random... Uh, Example I came up with. And I also don't know if this harder one is also uh, true or not as of uh, th this recording. At any rate, this complicated sentence is going to say, there's never been a gay mar marriage performed in any state that voted for a Republican presidential candidate since 2000. Woo, Nelly. So if you can get this one, you're a rock star and you can uh, just graduate from this unit, right? But think it through. We're going to have male and female and married in state again. I'm now adding two more. Republican is a predicate indicating that X is a candidate from the Republican Party. Okay, so Republican Mitt Romney would be true. Republican Barack Obama would be false. Republican My Toaster would be false. Okay, and then voted for is going to be did that state's electoral votes go to that candidate in that year? Okay, so Virginia Barack Obama 2012 is going to be true, that's going to be an element of the voted for relation, or that's going to be a triple of values that makes voted for true. Whereas, you know, Wyoming, Stephen Davies, 54 BC is certainly not going to be true. Okay, so true or false, or I mean, you know, not true or false, but how would you say this thing, which could be claimed as true or false, work that out on paper, see what you get. All right, that's what I got. Check that out. Wow. All right, so what I'm saying here is I've got person one, person two, and state. Those are what my three variables in the top line represent, right? So I'm saying it is not the case that there exists some person such that there exists another person and a state. So there does not exist any triple of values, P1, P2, and S. That's essentially what that boils down to, right? Such that P1 and P2 are both male, or P1 and P2 are both female, so that's the same as the previous slide, and P1 and P2 were married in S, so this is no longer Utah, right, because this is no longer a sentence about Utah, it's about any state that has a certain characteristic. So I'm saying you can't find a P1 and a P2 in a state such that they're both male or both female, and they were married in that state, and there was a candidate in some year such that that state voted for that candidate in that year, and it was a Republican candidate, and that year was greater than 2000. Oh, man. 
stuff can make your head hurt, right? I would definitely recommend that you go get a Coke and clear your mind and come back and go through those examples again, right? Because this stuff is very easy to get wrong and be misled into thinking you've got it right and you really need practice to be able to do this, right? Not all the examples are going to be that complicated, of course, but if you think about the stuff that's in your mind, my goodness, there's a lot of really, really convoluted, tangled things in there, right? Which are perfectly legitimate things and perfectly um, true, and yet it, it requires quite a lot of, you know, machinery in order to express them. And so that's what first order predicate logic is good at.